Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. This is JT, your host of the Consequence of Habit podcast. Thank you guys so much for, for joining me. Big shout out to our one and only sponsor uh, for now. Big news coming that way. But for now, Athletic Brewing, maker of the finest NA beer, craft beer. Let me, let me start over. The finest NA craft beer on the market, in my, in my opinion. You know, when I, uh, when I came to the conclusion that alcohol no longer played a part in my life, uh, I was bummed out. I was bummed out because I was, I was giving up this, this thing I truly appreciated, uh, you know, the taste of. Unfortunately, the, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. I, I had all these other repercussions. We had, oh, I don't know, consequences to my habit uh, that, that made, it, made it unsustainable. And here I am. So I'm giving it up. I'm giving up the taste of, of craft beer that I've that I identified with. I loved it. I loved the people that are around it. There was a lot of it I, I truly enjoyed. I just didn't like the, I just didn't like the poison. I didn't like the, the dark side of it. Uh, fortunately, I, I came across Athletic Brewing Company. You know, these guys, th- their whole motto is brew without compromise. And man, compromise is, is such an important word when I, when I think about uh, what they're doing, uh, my own journey and how I don't have to compromise the taste of amazing beer uh, because I gave up drinking. So whether you're somebody that just, just isn't going to drink tonight or doesn't want alcohol tonight for whatever your reasons are, that's on you. Uh, or you're, you're somebody like me, who says not only am I not going to drink tonight, but I'm just not going to drink, but I do love really good beer. Well, hot damn, man. There is something out there for you, and that is the Athletic Brewing Company. I don't care what kind of beer you like, they are making it. So be kind to yourself. Use the promo code capital C O H. Let me try that again. Use the promo code capital C O H 20 and get 20% off your first order. All right, before we sit down with this week's guest, I want you to see what we've got going on on the website. Please log on to consequenceofhabit.com. Uh, hit subscribe, man. Be more involved with. with uh, some of the the projects that we've got going on, uh, shoot me an email, subscribe, shoot me an email. Tell me what habits are working for you. Tell me some bad ones you would like to hear discussed here on the, on the podcast. And, uh, I'll do, I'll do my best to make it happen. We also have some big news that involves the nonprofit. Uh, I wish I could have already announced that. Uh, but if you subscribe, you'll be the first to know, you know, we're just waiting on paperwork. We're waiting on the old IRS lawyers, red tape, uh, but as soon as that hits, we've got some really exciting news of ways that I think I think we're going to be helping more people in a more direct way. I mean, I love what we're doing here, but I see some uh, some opportunities to do, to do some more. So, all right, this week on the podcast, we have on Mr. Pat Cunan. I tell you what, this Cunan family, they are, <laughs> that is an interesting group of people. Episode 35, I had Pat's son, Harry Cunan on, and, and that subject matter is a little heavier than, than this week's. Um, but So I implore you to check that out. But that brings me back to uh, this week's guest, Pat. You know, Pat and I have a couple of similarities. Not a ton, uh, but one of them happens to be, well, two of them happen to be the, the love of cycling and the other that we both worked at bike shops in high school. I haven't really talked about that much, but I've probably worked at three to four different bike shops in my life. Uh, and I never saw anything past turning wrenches, coming home with greasy hands, uh, and putting bikes together. So at some point in my life, I, you know, I punched out. I went off, I went off to the military and, and thought I was going to have to get a real job. Uh, but this week's guest, man, he saw something bigger. He saw a vision. He took his passion of cycling, his passion of bikes. And he, well, he went from turning wrenches to being the president of one of the largest bicycle companies in the world. And that is ASI. If that name does not sound familiar to you, how, uh, it's because it was an umbrella company. They own Fuji bicycles, Kestrel bicycles, all of the performance bicycle shops out there, uh, Breezer bicycles. If you're in a BMX, SE bicycles. So there are a few people in this world that are going to know the bike business like this week's guest. He is now the president of Yuba Bicycles. And if you have not seen a Yuba bicycle, man, it's like these guys. They took how you're supposed to build a bike, traditionally. They took those blueprints and, um, well, they crumbled them bad boys up and tossed them in the garbage. Start from scratch. They are making some innovative, practical bicycles for people that, I don't know, maybe you're using your bicycles to transport stuff or carry your kids around or, uh, well, they're wild, man. 
So check them out at yubabicycles.com. And without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Pat Kunan. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. It's JT here on the Consequence of Habit podcast. We are here with Pat. Pat, I really appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. Pat, one of the reasons I wanted to, to have you on here. Now, you guys, this was the first time we've ever had a, a father and son on the show. Um, but specifically, I wanted to talk to you about really where you started in the 1970s in the world of cycling. You know, I, I was thinking about some of the things that we have in common, and that is we both worked at bike shops at, from, a, from a young age. Am I, I'm correct in saying that? I, I was young. You were young. How, how old were you when you first started working at a bike shop? I was 11, but I was really almost 12. I started uh, on the Saturday before I turned 12. And you've literally gone from the time you were 11, and you've been involved in the, the world of cycling uh, until, until now, where now you're the president of, of Yuba Bicycle. So um, unlike you, as soon as I was done with high school, I was done working in a bike shop. I loved it. I loved the, I loved the, the atmosphere of being in a bike shop. I love the smell of the grease. I love the people that come in. I really enjoyed building bikes. Um, but at some point I just felt like I was, I, I had to go do more grown up things. And there's a part of me that really regrets that it's, there. There's, there's part of me that looks at, at, at people like you who stayed in the industry, continue to kind of move up through the ranks um, and, and, and I'm, I'm envious of it. So I'd, I'd love to just to talk to you about, about that. And then we're going to get into some of the, the, the interesting parts of, of not just you, but you and your family. So, um, let's, let's, first of all, where are you from and how'd you get into uh, working at a bike shop at age 11? So I'm, I'm from Glenside, Pennsylvania. And, uh, this grade school that I went to was, um, uh, Glenside Weldon Elementary, and across the street from Glenside Weldon was Keswick Bike Shop. And literally, if you lived on my side of Easton Road, you parked your bike at the bike shop. And if you lived on the other side of Easton Road, you parked behind the school. So I parked my bike every morning at, at the bike shop and generally went in every day after school and hung out. And it, even before I started there, I was what they nicely called a gopher, you know, yeah. go, go for Lance crackers, go for a milkshake, go for a Coke. So I, I would sort of ingratiate myself to everyone that worked there and beg them for a job. Mm. And they, they finally relented uh, after, you know, when I finished sixth grade that summer, I started there full time. Yeah. What, what was it about, what was it about cycling? What was it about bikes that kind of drew you in? You know, it was 1970 when I started and it was just, you know, what we all did. I mean, before I worked there, my friends and I would go to the the junkyard at Flory's Pond, you know, a, a mile up the street on Eastern Road. And we would find old bikes and, and schlep them back to our, our houses and rebuild them and, you know, just constantly evolving them. Yeah. Nobody really had you know, a new bike, we all were working on just, you know, old bikes and hand-me-downs and, you know, Stingrays got popular and wheelies got popular and we, we sort of followed that. But we were always tinkerers with our bikes as, as a group of kids. Yeah. So you start working at this bike shop and I, I'm assuming that this goes up through high school? Through, through high school. Sort of, I, I could break this conversation maybe a little bit out into the decades, you know? Okay. So yep. in, in the seventies, I was in retail. Um, that that's, you know, and, and a lot of it in that bike shop through high school. Then, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, literally and, and figuratively the day I graduated from high school, uh, I moved out of my parents' house and moved to uh, Ocean City, New Jersey. I had a bike, a, a shop uh, in Ventnor, New Jersey, Bike Works, that I had a job all lined up for. And mm -hmm. I was think, thinking, I'm an adult, I'm on my own, I've got a job, I've got a career, and now I'm going to work in a different state in a bike shop. And I 
you know, basically moved to New Jersey to be in the bike business. So, so you graduate, you go on, you, you, you're working at, a, at another bike shop. At some point, uh, you end up starting your own bike company. What I'm probably fast forwarding way too much here. Um, when did that occur? And then kind of what was the motivation behind that? So, um, it, it, that will take you back a little bit or take us back a little bit to my, um, my family and, and, and what I was doing. So in the seventies, you know, I worked in a bike shop, was a avid tourist, you know, had great opportunities to meet different people that influenced me. And I'd say almost now that, you know, I, I didn't know anything you know, when I got a job as a 12 year old, I just could see, oh, I could do that, or I could do that. And you meet people along the way. And you start to realize, okay, you know, maybe I could be a salesman and call on bike shops. So, you know, that was my first job out of a bike shop um, that, that got me into the industry. That was, you know, in 1979, I sort of made that break. I had also, when I graduated from high school and, and moved out, I had no intention of ever going to college. Um, and my parents were of the mindset, why would you go to college? You have a job. So right, right. there wasn't any, you know, like that's what people do. It wasn't what you did in my family. If you did have a job, you went to college, but if you had one, you went to work. Mm. So in my, you know, in the late seventies, I would visit it some of my friends at college and thought, well, wow, this is a pretty cool thing to do and, and enrolled and started going to college and could never really afford to go full-time. So I went full-time for a semester, ran out of money, went part-time and, and, you know, started on a path. But in uh, 1982, I got an incredible job at Ross Bicycles and Ross Bicycles was at that time the second largest bike company in the in the dealer part of the market. So I'm, you know, really, um, you know, 21 years old, 22, and I'm a sales manager in this company. And just through no skill of my own, the family that owned it was going through um, a, a separation. So the my friend, Randy Ross, who became my friend, his dad and his sister owned the company. They were second generation. Randy was third generation and they split. And when they split, a lot of the more seasoned people quit and went with the other family. And I ended up being the national sales manager at 23 wow. years old and was actively involved in product. And we were you know, it, in 1982, I was featured in advertisements for Ross Mountain Bikes and was on posters. And there was, there was a racing scene that Ross was really involved with. I was never, you know, a, a bike racer or any good at bike racing, but I was a decent cyclist. And I became sort of the face of Ross Mountain Bikes through, you know, their marketing. So I became pretty well known at a very young age. And they also allowed me to get involved internationally. So I started going to Taiwan and China in 1985 and Europe and really was, um, you know, on a roll with, you know, phenomenal job making, you know, really good money, starting my family, you know, having a child. Uh, my oldest son was born in 1987. and you know, as things sometimes happen, uh, Ross went bankrupt um, and I lost my job. And, you know, I was, you know, for a young guy, really well known in the industry. I was making a lot of money. I had a big house. I had a child and I realized I don't have a college education. And I thought, you know, I've got to figure that out. Yeah. Um, so it, it caused me to, you know, reset a little bit. Um, and I, I took a job with Giant Bicycle, who at that point was brand new in the market. And I felt like they had hired, this may sound a little 
conceded, but they hired like the A team. They hired all these really good people from all these different companies and immediately created a very substantial company in the United States. And part of my deal with the uh, president of the company, Bill Austin, who became an important mentor for me, was you know that I needed to finish college. I would you know be happy to join the company, but you got to allow my schedule to um, to finish college, which he was a huge uh, advocate for education, and so he he a hundred percent supported me, and I was able to um, get through college you know by the early nineties, and uh, and at that point I I started my own company because um, I felt that you know that I was ready yeah. to to do that, and I had at that point. Two children. I had my second child, Harry, who you met while I worked at Giant. And then I decided I would start a company called Canam Bicycle. And we brought in um, single speeds, you know, what, what became very popular. And I sort of always joke, it's never good to be that far ahead of your time when you're <laughs> importing bikes, you know, yeah. by the hundreds. Yeah. But, but we did, uh, company went on for you know, through the nineties that allowed me to be sort of close to my kids at a certain age and coach and, you know, hang out at their things, but still, you know, travel three weeks at a time and Asia and Europe and, and, and develop my relationships, you know, and, and the business. What, what a crazy time though. To, to, you know, you talk about Ross mountain bikes. That was my first mountain bike. It was a Ross. Mount, oh, really? That's great. A Ross Mount St. Helen. I remember it. I, I designed it. Did you really see this? Yeah. Is, this is insane. Yeah. Uh, I was living in Middletown, New York and, um, mountain biking was as far as I knew was just coming along. I, I, my, my dad had been into road racing. Um, I was racing road bikes and then mountain biking was coming around. I got a, a Ross Mount St. Helens, which, which probably weighed in at about 50 something pounds. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were a little heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but especially but, the ones made in Allentown. So oh, oh, is that where they were made? They were made in Allentown. They eventually through the late eighties, they moved to um, Taiwan, but the factory, when I started there, it was a factory in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I loved it. So and what I mean by in an interesting time is when we talk about innovation, um, mountain biking, you're going to be way more versed or, or well-versed in, in, in the history of it. But this is something that they were doing what out in Marin County in the seventies where guys were just kind of making their own bikes and, and please jump in if I'm butchering this, this history. Um, but, but the mountain biking wasn't a, a wasn't a thing that as far as I knew of on the East coast in, until, uh, until someone bought me a, a Ross Mount St. Helen. But, um, it had to be a crazy time to be inv involved in a company that was literally coming out with, with uh, something kind of new to the industry. It was a lot of fun. And Ross and a fellow by the name of John Kirkpatrick, who has since passed away, was our director of marketing. Ross gets credit for starting the sport of mountain biking. Um, John was incredibly passionate. There were races and, and things that were going on, but it wasn't organized. So Ross started a team called the Ross Indians, and we hired some of these great independent riders. And we teamed up with Swatch, the watch company sure. back in 1984, and did a big race in Wendell State Forest in uh, Massachusetts. And it had a $10,000 purse. And you know, all of the Ned Overin, Joe Murray, sure. uh, John Tomac, um, they were all there and Jackie Phelan and, you know, it was men, women, it was, a, you know, a huge event. We, did, we had no idea what we were doing, but we did it anyway. Um, so it was, you know, and, and um, Chris Chance from, you know, um, his, you know, his company, we had our riders, they broke a bike. He was in Boston. You know, he came, you know, he, we sent the bike over to him. He, he welded it up and, you know, braced it and, and fixed it. It was a small community. And Ross was in an odd spot because we were this sort of established normal brand that was totally all in 
on mountain bikes. And so was Specialized. And so were, you know, a lot of other companies, but we were on the East Coast and we were doing it, you know, a little differently than, than the other folks were. Mm. Um, but it was, that was a, a phenomenal time. I'll tell you this because it, it, to me, it's really interesting. So we developed these things. We, we didn't know. I mean, our market was kids coming out of BMX because there was a BMX boom in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. 79 was a huge BMX boom. This is now 82 to 84. We're thinking, okay, we're going to get these folks and they're going to keep riding. You know, they're now 16, 18, 20. They're going to ride bikes and this is going to be great. We're going to, you know, revitalize the bike industry with these kids. So I went to a, a gear rally, which was a group of people that would camp and you'd go on, you know, three day, it was a three day event over Memorial day weekend. And I brought samples of these bikes and I remember I wrote a memo about it because what happened was everybody was really interested in these bikes. And I had beautiful Jim Red K handmade signature, raw signature touring bikes and Tom Kellogg road bikes. We had phenomenally gorgeous bikes there. And I had the, the um, Force One, which was a mountain bike, and everybody was riding it. You know, all that, they, that's what they wanted to ride. And th that was Memorial Day 1982. So I came back, wrote a memo, and said, hey, there, this, this thing has legs, you know, um, not understanding it. And we went, and I, I traveled around the country selling these bikes to bike dealers. And I, I remember on this one trip I had from um, – St. Louis to Kansas City, Missouri, just across Missouri. And my first shop is Columbia, Missouri. And I go in and I sell this guy a bike. He was a raw dealer. And I said, you know, this is, these are going to be great. This is, you know, I told him who was going to ride it, you know, these BMX kids. And he bought one. I was a fairly decent salesman. I went across and, you know, we sold, maybe we visited 15 stores. I sold 10. A couple months later, I go back. And I go into the store in Columbia, Missouri. I'll never forget it. The guy's like, and I said, how, how did you do? I sold it. I said, great. You know, and he said, well, I said, how many more do you want? I, I don't want any. I said, why not? He said, well, the mailman bought it. And I said, okay. So he didn't buy any more. I go to another shop farther along and he sold it. And I said, you want to buy any more? He said, no. I said, well, why not? He said, the guy was in here with his kid, and he looked at it, and he bought it. And I didn't know the line that I learned later in life that, you know, which was, well, if you don't do it again, the chance of selling them is, you know, it's not going to happen. Right. What was happening were people were buying them that weren't who we thought. It mm. was adults, people that – just had kids or wanted to ride a bike or they thought it was fun. They did, it wasn't threatening. So the whole industry changed from serving kids to serving adults through mountain bikes, but by no, the industry didn't do it. Right. The product was just appealing to people that wanted to just ride. Mountain bikes certainly drove the sport and we've always believed, or I believed in sort of an influencer model but I, I digress. So that that's uh, my so, mountain bike. Yeah, no, it's interesting. because So is it the fact that you, that the story that, or, or, or your pitch was, Hey, this is, this is going to be who's buying it. And the fact that that wasn't the actual, um, the, the consumers that were buying it, did, is that what turned them off from, from, from ordering more at that point? Like, well, at, no, no. at that point, yeah, because yeah, yeah. bike shops were geared to selling kids yeah. and adults, you know, there were always the enthusiasts that bought bikes, but normal adults didn't buy bikes anymore. Mm. So the market was people that were tourists, racers, whatever, and then kids. And what happened, and it's not a good thing, is bike shops actually changed their focus away from kids, stopped really selling kids bikes in many cases, or, or really downplaying them. And the mass merchants got some decent brands like Mongoose, and and then they took over the kids' business. So the bike shops lost kids for years and years and years. We still yeah. haven't gotten them back. Yeah, you're right. Because I, I remember going into bike shops, and it was 
it was primarily uh, uh, BMX bikes, freestyle bikes when they came out. I, I believe I had a couple of Ross freestyle bikes. I, I mean, we had piranhas. We had I had a piranha. Ross piranha. Yeah, I had a piranha, uh, a gray one. And um, that's what you saw. You saw maybe a couple road bikes, uh, but but for the most part, they were kids' bikes. There were other shops that sold uh, uh, more of, of a like a European road bike, and they kind of specialized in those. But but the majority of the shops I was in, um, it was if if there were adults in there, it's because they had their kids and they were buying them a bike. Um, but so so you, fast forward, you start your own bike company, and and I like what you said that it, it's. Although you may go down in the history book of being way ahead of everybody else and having single speeds, it doesn't help in real time at that moment to sell bikes, right? It's, it's, right. Um, did you have a concept that this was something that was going to catch on? I mean, what, what motivated you to even do that? Um, I thought they were fun to ride, well, you, you know, and they were a good training bike and, you know, that, that so I, and it was a niche, there weren't a lot of people in it. So I thought, okay, I can, you know, get some notoriety for the bike. It was called the Indigo 96. I did it in 1993 with the idea that this is a training bike that could get you to the Olympics. So that's why I put 96 on it. Oh, that's cool. And, um, you know, they, they sold okay. What, what was cool is years later when I was taking my kids around to visit colleges, um, you know, in the 2004, 2005, yep. I saw these modified bikes that, that on all the college campuses of people making single speeds. And at the time I was at ASI and we owned the SC brand, which was a BMX brand. And I said to the product manager, Todd Lyons, I said, let's, let's do a single speed, but let's make it $200 mm -hmm. so that you know, these college kids can buy it. And we created that, sold like crazy. I mean, and then SE sort of got into that single speed wor world in a big way by producing a product that people wanted. So I knew the product really well from my earlier time and sure. then saw all of a sudden, you know, there's this market, but there's not anybody, any, any company supporting it with brand new product at a, at a good price. Yeah. And I'll, what often happens in the bike business, it happened with BMX, it happened with Mountain, and it happened with single speeds, is a lot of new brands that are outside the industry make bikes. So brands like a Pure Cycle, they came out of nowhere selling single speed bikes to college kids that didn't, you know, that, that they just wanted a bike. Yeah. Am I correct in saying too, you know, I talk about the innovation of the industry or how the industry changed from the beginning of the mountain bike. You mentioned Ross was building bikes in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is really close to, to where both you and I are now. Um, and then, and then the bikes start, even some of the bigger brands, like, you know, Cannondale was a big one that, you know, used to be made in Vermont. And then at some point, everything switches over to Asia. Uh, you were part of a lot of this stuff uh, as, as we start. I mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, is that how it worked? Where hey, we've got these American-made uh, bikes. Uh, tr Trek, I'm, I would think Trek was made here originally. Am I it was. It started in Wisconsin. Yep. Um, um, and then, and then it it moves over to Asia. Uh, what was it like to be in the industry when all when all of that starts happening? No, it was. It's a lot to do with my company and why I changed it. So. Um, my company evolved into being a company that supported manufacturers like Huffy, Murray, Roadmaster, Trek, specialized at the time was making bikes in Utah. Canada was still making bikes at that point in Pennsylvania. So we were selling uh, parts to them and doing marketing for component brands. And during that time, and this is, I'll come back and forth a little bit, but um, NAFTA was uh, approved in 1993. So, and that's when I had my business and I had done business in Mexico when I was at Ross, we started importing from Mexico. So I, I knew a lot about the Mexican market and felt very strongly that, you know, we could develop a, a strong manufacturing base because of NAFTA. 
and, and really diverted. I spent a tremendous amount of time in the 90s going back and forth to, uh, to Monterey, Mexico, and Mexico City. But what happened was there was, um, so there was a huge manufacturing base in the United States. In the, in the mid-90s, it was about, you know, depending on who you ask, eight, nine million bikes. Huffy, Murray, Roadmaster, the mass merchant level bikes were, for the most part, made in the United States. That made sense because there was an 11% import duty on kids' bikes, and there was a 5.5% duty on road bikes. And that goes back to the English racers of the 60s mm. and the balloon tire bikes that Schwinn and the others were making. So there was the government and tariffs are intended to protect manufacturing jobs in the United States. So you know, the, the tariff was slightly higher on, on kids' bikes because that's what were made here and fat tire bikes. So mountain bikes made a lot of sense to be made here at that time. So in the – China started to becoming sort of a major global player in the market, um, you know, in, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, but basically they, they were putting a lot of pressure on – the mass merchants, Huffy, Murray, and Roadmaster. And in Europe, they imposed dumping duties against China-made bicycles. And in Mexico, they imposed dumping duties. And in the United States, there was a very large case that they should impose dumping duties on China against bicycles. So this was during the one Clinton second. administration. One sec, Pat. One sec, Pat. What, just explain real quick what a dumping duty is. So a dumping duty is a penalty. Okay. So it's like what everybody learned about with the Trump tariffs, right? So in, in Europe at that time, the, the, you could pay a 50% extra tax to get a bike from China. So wow. in, in the United States, uh, you know, the, uh, the companies that were making bikes here were arguing that, hey, we can't compete with China. And they couldn't compete with China. And nowhere in the world could compete with China. Um, because China was dumping, which means selling it below your cost. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what eventually happened was the, 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 they decided, the government decided not to impose dumping duties on China, and those 9 million bikes went down to nothing. Mm -hmm. And the whole work and, and all I was involved with at NAFTA imploded. There was mm -hmm. no, Mexico couldn't compete with China either. So that caused a pivot in my world and an opportunity came up and a lot of companies went bankrupt at that time. So Schwinn and GT went bankrupt because the, the market was just really going through a dramatic change mm -hmm. in the late um, 90s. Mountain bikes were sort of slowing down. Road bikes had not kicked in yet. You know, the Lance Armstrong effect. But in any event, so I end up, 2001, literally September 15th of 2001, joining Fuji as the president. And Fuji was at that time $7 million company worldwide, right. not doing well. Schwinn had sold in bankruptcy literally on September 11th, um, 2001. The, the bankruptcy closed to so the industry was going through this just crazy time. And I ended up, you know, at Fuji for the, for the two thousands with, to me, a brand that I bought my first Fuji in, in 1971, you know, at Keswick cycle, they were really great bikes, always great quality, but they had sort of missed the mountain bike boom and were, you know, teetering on the edge of, of bankruptcy. And I mm -hmm. thought this is my opportunity. So you go to Fuji bikes and it's funny, you, you mentioned you, you go there when they're kind of the lowest of low, but, but shortly after you get there, things begin to change. Things began to change. And, you know, and I know you want to talk about sort of sponsorship and, and all that kind of, you know, the whole race world because Fuji became and is right now, they make as, as good a road bike as anybody in the world. Um, but at that time, um, when I joined, 
Fuji was in the sponsorship world, but it wasn't connected to the product or anything else. So we were actually buying the bikes. We were sponsoring the Mercury team, which was a phenomenally good U.S. team. I remember that. And, uh, but we were buying the frames that the Mercury team was riding on from Peter Teschner in Australia. And I get there and we have a contract and I'm like, uh, there's no way we're continuing to sponsor a team when we don't make the products that they ride. Yeah. And at that time it wasn't that uncommon that people did that. And certainly, you know, in the eighties, um, you know, many teams use, you know, Ben Serrata and folks like that to build their bikes. But, you know, this was a different era. And I thought, you know, Fuji can make, we can make good bikes. We just have to make them and <laughs> prepare the, the company to, right. to make them. I knew what it took to make them, you know, okay. who to hire to create the products. And that was when carbon was just coming into the market. So we made a strategic decision, right? We're not sponsoring until we're ready to sponsor with our own product. So by uh, 2004, we had developed our first carbon road frame. Um, we were set up in Europe. We were profitable. We were growing. You know, we were on the right path. At the same time, you know, Lance Armstrong is winning the Tour de France, and everybody wants to buy a road bike. And Fuji was this great road bike brand name. So we had a lot of of runway to work with this brand. And uh, we couldn't afford to sponsor, you know, a big men's team at that point in time. Um, but we, we, we had someone that worked for us that um, really knew the sport and knew sponsorship and um, was our director of marketing at the time, you know, Karen Bliss, who became our chief marketing officer. So she was sort of the architect of our strategy to break into the sport. And in 2004, with this first frame, we had um, wins, world championship wins, you know, in the women's Peloton, we were winning the Philadelphia race and we were, we had a legitimate product that we made that we own the molds for that we use that and just continue to invest and slowly, you know, develop relationships with the sport so that by, you know, 2011, we were, you know, in the tour de France, you know, we were, um, we won the, the tour of Spain, you know, we had in a short period of time made it to the, to the highest level of competitive racing and we're winning. And, um, you know, and we had some awkwardness and, and, you know, we had some, some issues that, um, that were complicated, which we get into if you want during the, the tour to, to, you know, the Vuelta that, that we eventually won, but, you know, we had to make some tough decisions on product and, and to, to keep the team together. Yeah, but so sponsorship was critical to that. My, my wife and I were watching the uh, the the thirty for thirty um, on Le Mans, and and <clears throat> excuse me, I think uh, it's the one that, that covers b- between him and and Bernard, you know, uh, and they're riding the riding Huffies, right? It's, I mean, there's a sticker on on the bike that says Huffy, and yeah, that almost seems unheard of now. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, but, uh, it's, it's, but they had, they had Milton was making those bikes for them. So the guy, they were, they hired a guy that was building. Really? So Huffy hire, yeah. hires a frame builder. Uh, yeah. to, so, so they, now, can legitimately, they may have used other frame builders, but they sure. did have, they legitimately were making $10,000. And th- this was, you know, a long, long time ago, maybe yeah, it wasn't yeah. that much, but they were making high dollar bikes in Ohio. Wow. You, you mentioned uh, Ben Serrata too. So growing up in, in being around the uh, bikes, there was always certain companies or frame builders that were kind of renowned. So there was your your bikes, you, you know, your companies like a Specialized or a Trek or a Cannondale that made 
you know, maybe a bike that was just a couple steps better than you could find in a, in a department store, all the way up to a higher end bike. And then there were the custom frame builders, like the Serratas. Uh, and that was on another level. Like that was um, something really, truly special to even to, when someone came in with, with one of those or like a Moots or, you know, when titanium was first really coming around. Um, are these people that you're conversing with on a regular basis in, in, in this cycling industry? Are these oh people? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we were at Ross, well, well Ben Serrata, one of all, he's a very good personal close friend of okay. mine. He yep. and, he and Greg Lamont, um, came to, our house for a political fundraiser That's years right. ago. So um, he's phenomenal. He made a lot of the bikes for, for the 7-Eleven team. Mm -hmm. So he was in the, you know, pro Peloton making some of the best bikes, you know, in the world for a long, long time, not, not, not with his name on it, but he, uh, he, he's, he's, he's brilliant. And in the mountain bike world, you know, Joe Breeze is someone that I met in the early eighties and, and then was fortunate enough to, to buy his company in 2008 when I was at ASI. So those frame builders were critically important if you wanted to build good bikes. I yeah. mean, you know, and, and at Ross, we had Tom Kellogg and Jim Redkay were our, you know, our, our main, you know, gurus that, that made our top, top level bikes in Allentown, the signature series and, and other companies did, including Huffy, the, the same sort of thing, but it, it was trickle down. I mean, you did need these, you know, really, really brilliant people to help you make great bikes. Mm. Before we get into the sponsorship, because we, we've covered a, a decent chunk of, of time on, um, on your personal level, you know, you mentioned having a couple of kids, but, but at what point, uh, anyone, I, I encourage anyone who's listening to this, you can always go back. If you didn't hear, l listen to, to his, uh, his son's Harry story, it's unbelievably inspirational. Uh, and it's one I really, I, I'm just even proud he had taken part in. Um, but your, your wife gets involved in politics. Now, am I, did I read this right? You were somehow involved in politics as well. So we, we met in politics in 1978. We were, both committee people, which is sort of the entry level job that you get elected for, you need 10 signatures on a petition and then you, <laughs> you run. So we, we met after we were both elected, we met um, and worked on Joe Hoffel's campaign uh, as a state representative. Uh, and my father and my family were involved in politics. My father, you know, ran for that seat that, um, Joe Hoffel seat that eventually my wife won. My father never won, but he, he definitely kept trying. Um, but he was a Democrat and we were in a very Republican area. And mm -hmm. I, I think by the end of the life, he probably would have been as associated maybe more with Republicans, oh, yeah. but that's <laughs> a different story for another day. Yeah. So yeah, politics has always been part of, we've always been interested in it. Um, you know, I certainly have been an advocate for bicycles for for my entire career, and have have done everything I can to support the professional advocates through the Philadelphia Bike Coalition, People for Bikes. Uh, been the chairman of People for Bikes and and the Bicycle Products Suppliers Association. I believe it's incredibly important for the industry to support the advocates who ultimately support the industry by making, you know, places better and safer for people to use bikes. It's, I'm always blown away. Uh, anytime I've been over in Europe, so specifically the Netherlands and, and you, you get off a train and it's just a sea of bicycles. Um, and you see parents riding with their kids on, on, you know, either on the bar or they, you know, they have some type of little seat for, for the, for the, for the child. And, and it's so ingrained into their life. And I just thought, man, what a, what a cool way to, to one, just to get around all oh, the health benefits, the sustainability side of things. It really is just a, um, a better way to, to, to do things, but, uh, but you have to have that infrastructure in place and, and the rules and laws and, uh, to be able to make something like that happen, I imagine. You, you do. And I, I'm gonna, um, 
inject a little history yes. and perspective here. Sure. A lot of people believe that, well, they always rode bikes in Europe and, you know, that's the way it was and that's the way it is. And, and that's actually, that's not accurate. Mm-hmm. So they realized in the, you know, in the first sort of energy problem in the early 70s, which we did in the United States too, which sure. caused a bike boom, that, you know, they could have a car culture or they could have a different culture. And in in the Netherlands especially, they decided that, you know what, we're going to make bikes, encourage cycling. They had the first bike share program, mm. you know, which was bikes to just use. It was a disaster because they, they put bikes around and people used them and then ended up throwing them in the water and abusing them. Yeah. So uh, what what they did in the Netherlands was not random. It was planned mm. and, and they've gotten a good result of it. And in other countries where they create a, a safe place to ride and encourage cycling by making it more convenient. Mm. And that's the key thing I think that's so important to remember. And, you know, we're both, we go to the shore, right? We have a place in Cape May. People don't, ride bikes in Cape May just because they're in Cape May. People ride bikes in Cape May because you can't park. Yeah, It's the most convenient way to get around. You know, it's also flat and other things. It's safe, but people do what's convenient. So in Europe, they make it convenient to ride a bike and they make it inconvenient to drive a car. Mm. And, you know, and we're going to get into e-bikes, I think, in a minute, but that's really the dynamic of what you know, how you change um, how people use a bike to get around. Mm. You you take it from recreation, which is what it primarily is in the United States, and you make it part of the transportation options that people have, and then they'll ride bikes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was blown away the first time I got off the train there. Oh, yeah, I was around, it's like, great. Man, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, but all right, getting back. So, so I, I do want to just hit these things because as interesting as your history in the world of cycling, it is, you've, you've got a, you've got a wife who's, who's now a state representative. There's rumors of a, of a possible run at Senate. Uh, you, Harry, who I've already spoken about, uh, your other son, Pat, who was a speech writer for Obama. Um, Correct. and, and I just saw in the news a couple days ago, he's got a new project that he's working on. Um, with Trevor, with uh, Trevor Noah, yeah. they're, they're remaking a movie called The President's Analyst uh, that Pat wrote. They both, you know, for Paramount, and now Trevor Noah is his boss. And and I don't, I don't know much more than what I read because my son, I, I don't know if he learned it in the White House. He's like, it's a it's need to know basis. So I, yeah. I, do, I don't need to know more than he's working with Trevor Noah on this project. <laughs> you gotta so sign that's a, all I know. You got to sign an NDA to get any more, I think. Pretty much. He's, he's, uh, maybe, maybe he'll open up to you, but uh, <laughs> no, to me, he just, you know, I, I read it in the, in the, you know, I, he, he gives me like a one hour heads up. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just thinking it, you know, again, it's your, I said it before we started, I, I, man, your, your, your family dinners have to be, uh, I, I don't even know who would talk first. I mean, there, there's kind of, just so many, there's, you guys are covering such a broad spectrum of things that it's, um, it's definitely gotta be, uh, an interesting place to be at times. Well, we, it, it, you know, it was mostly takeout. You know? Yeah, right. That was right, our, right. our our world. Um, but, you know, my wife's sort of re-entry to politics had, she always wanted to do it. You know, we, we you know, we wanted to do right by our kids. And, and as you know, Harry, we, Harry had a, has an opioid addiction. Sure. You know, one of the terms that you'd have to use to describe him is he's a drug addict. He's been clean for eight years and he's working really hard at his recovery. But, you know, um, we just, just use words to describe our kids. And that is a harsh reality word that, that is very difficult to use, but it's, it's accurate. Um, my wife sort of realized through encouragement from our son that she should do it. You know, she was a lawyer for 10 years, then she was a college professor. And then she decided um, that she would take the plunge, got involved 
locally. I mean, she, she was taking, this is funny, it, it's in their book, but she, she very prepared for whatever she does. So as she decided, okay, I'm going to get involved in politics, she enrolled at Penn in a, you know, in a class to learn about politics. And Ed Rendell was one of her teachers, and so was Michael Nutter, who, wow. who we had known. But so Ed Rendell basically said to the class, hey, in politics, the one thing you have to do is ask. So when she decided to run for township commissioner, which Ed Rendell could still always says supervisor, she said to him, she said, Governor, um, I'd like you to do a fundraiser at my house for commissioner. And he said, I, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> and she's like, well, sh- sure you should, you know, you said to ask. So anyway, he comes to our house for this local commissioner's race, stayed much longer than probably what he wanted. We had a big crowd of people at our house that sort of got her into local politics. Then she became a state rep, you know, when right as she was running for the election, Harry went into um, treatment at Karen. We always, you know, were aware that when you do that, when you throw your hat, you know, in the arena, you're subject to personal attack and criticism. And, you know, for whatever reason, they liked to attack me when she was running. Um, My son, Pat, who's somewhat writes comedy, he wanted her to call and, you know, say you, you really ran a good race against my husband. <laughs> um, you missed the mark. He He's not running. But he wasn't running. So, <laughs> right. um, but the, the point is, you know, we, we're very fortunate as a family. We were able to, I think, Harry brought us together through, through what, what he went through. Um, we all learned a lot. Um, it's not like many things that you learn, you don't necessarily want to learn it, but, but we feel blessed, Sure, you know, that we have learned it. Um, but we were never worried about, you know, what people would say because, you know, people say bad things, whether they're true or false. So we, we maybe were ready with a thick skin um, for the, the kind of attacks that would come. Yeah. I literally had this conversation uh, yesterday. And my experience has been that when, when, you know, people can look at something like that and, and see a vulnerability, right. But, but it's how those things are handled in life. Um, that when you, when, when you put these things out there and especially when it, when it comes to substance misuse, uh, that time, even well, still today, the opiate, uh, crisis is in full effect. It's affecting a lot more people than maybe traditionally uh, addiction had affected. Um, and anyone who would attack something like that, it, it to, to me, it just goes to the character of the person. And when you, in, when not embrace it, but you are at least publicly acknowledging, yes, hey, man, this is the human experience. We're struggling. We're going to get through it because we're a family and we're going to do what we need to do to get through it. Uh, if anything, that lowers uh, barriers between people and your ability to communicate with them. And and I think adds connection. And and, and I think that's, it's what I felt through this experience and, and talking to people like Harry talking about my own story. Um, and I'm kind of just kind of going off on a tangent, but really I was focused on how insanely interesting everyone in your family, uh, is in, in, in so many different ways, but that it had to be, it had to be a tricky time because you've got everything going on in the cycling industry. You're probably being called to Asia on a fairly regular basis. I would imagine with ASI and, and uh, just real quickly, anyone who knows bikes, ASI at the time owned Kestrel, Fuji, Breezer, all of the performance bike shops, correct? Yeah. SE and SE brand and all the performance stores. So we were vertically integrated. Massive massive uh so um that had to be a just a precarious time in in uh the canaan tribe there of of kind of navigating through all of these things kind of simultaneously 
And I'm, that's more of a statement that you can you can speak on that well, if you like. It, it, or, or, so it, it was a challenge. But I want to spend one minute on one thing. So I sure. grew up in an Irish family, and you know anybody that would meet my father on the street who you know had been involved in politics would say that you know if they asked him how he was, he would say he was great. If he were any better, he couldn't stand it. And it was yeah. critically important to my father that everyone perceive his family as being successful, whatever that meant. And we had our own, you know, raft of problems in my family, but my father was very Irish in that you, you just, you don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I didn't like that. Um, but I realized um, that I was more like my father than I thought and was worried, I think, about how, people would perceive my family, our family mm -hmm. with Harry's addiction. And I think it made it more difficult for me um, to, to, to sort of deal with it. Not mm -hmm. that I was trying to hide it, but you know, that I, I, it, it, I had blinders on, I, I think culturally and what um, learning about addiction did and what, Karen, which is the place that Harry went and where he now works, taught me was talking about it is, is the way to deal with it. You know, we had addiction in our family. I remember I got caught drunk as a, as a kid in 10th, 10th grade, 9th grade, 7th grade, who even knows, all those years for sure. But one time my father took me to meet one of his first cousins who was the drunk in the town. He said, this is what's going to happen to you. Mm. If you do this, you know, yeah. this is, this is the result. You can go down this route and this is how you're going to hang out. He was a handsome man, but he was destroyed by then. You know, his look, his affect, sure. his teeth, you know, and my father would say he was the most popular guy in the town could sing, you know, at any place, but, you know, alcohol destroyed them. So that was my father's way to teach me was, that, okay, this is an outcome. Yeah. If you want that, scared the crap out of me. Um, Consequence of and I still don't know, you know, I always drink. I still drink. I don't, do I drink too much? Am I an alcoholic? Am I, you know, I, who knows, but I, <laughs> you know, I worry about it. Right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, um, well, Harry and I discussed it too. I mean, not your drinking, but just the consequences of habits. Everybody has their own. And unfortunately, with the what the influx of opiates did is it brought what was it was more something that was affecting the counterculture or, or different groups, and it brought it to the surface. And we saw what the the the, tr the the consequences of of what these opiates are doing. And it was in everybody's face. It wasn't. It wasn't in some. 1970, you know, tour bus of a rock band or, or in a community that you weren't familiar with, it was your next door neighbor. It was your kids. It was, it, it was, it was everywhere. Um, and, and I, I agree. I think talking about it is, uh, the, 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 the hardest thing I think for a lot of people is a stigma around it and, and it's not comfortable to talk about it, but that that stigma is what keeps people from coming forward when they are having issues because uh, they, they certainly they don't you know it's, it's an intimate thing to put out in front of everybody and that's one of the things i think it was just it's just so brave of of, of harry and your family and, and you know to write a book to put that stuff out there is is we need more of it i i i, I do believe that so um but I, I digress because uh, there was one thing on the cycling side of things that I really I wanted to to hit. So you're an ASI at this point. Some of these brands, um, we're, we're seeing a difference or a shift from the local bike shop you're working at at age 11 to uh, these large companies like a performance bike shop. Um, where they're cross, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a chain. Uh, and then you can even order bikes now online, whether it be like a bikes direct or, or, um, I think Canyon is the other one that you can, you can start ordering these like amazing sure. bikes right online. Was there 
any part of you that that had a, had a, had to come to terms with that because you know the, the, you know there's always been the thing buy from your local bike shop buy from your local bike shop and and I'm just curious to to your thought process on that as you're going through it I mean it's it's almost inevitable I mean you, I mean it's like saying hey buy a blockbuster right? but things are going to change it's just part of the the, the the how things work but uh, how was it to be in in uh, you know the bike business during that time JT that. It's an interesting question, you know, the, the distribution part of this. And as you said, you know, ASI became Advanced Sports Enterprises and, and when it merged with performance, but you brought up a couple of names there, Canyon, Bikes Direct. So, you know, what any company does is it ultimately markets mm -hmm. and there's different distribution channels that consumers are interested in. So there's bike shops, there's consumer direct, there's mass merchants, there's sporting goods stores, you know, and brands normally find success with a certain amount of focus. So when I started at ASI, um, ASI's largest customers were Colorado Cyclist, which was a mail order company. I remember it. And Bikes Direct. Um, and my first meeting with Doug Brunsman, who's the owner of Colorado Cyclist, who I was friends with and did much business with at my own company before I got to Fuji. My first meeting was, Pat, great, I'm dropping Fuji. You guys don't listen to me. I'm starting my own brand of bikes. So I'm there. Okay. Um, so I lost, you know, two weeks into the job, our largest customer. Um, and that caused us to sort of make a decision from a marketing standpoint of what our distribution was going to be. Cause we knew a lot of stuff was going on. Fuji had been in Dick sporting goods and sports authority and was also in um, Colorado cyclist and was, and bikes direct was selling Fuji. So we just made a decision and said, you know what? Fuji's going to be a, a direct to, um, you know, work through IBDs, bike, bike shops. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to do. And we wouldn't be sold online. So we, we continued to work with Bikes Direct and sold him older model bikes for a long time. And then we actually sold and, and manufactured bikes for him under his brands like, you know, Motor right, and right. things like that. And we, we eventually made... Colorado cyclist Douglas brand bikes. We, we sourced them for him. Um, so when I started, we started almost from at a very small place, but in a market with road bikes, it was growing and performance uh, at that time had about 40 stores in, in 2002 and performance had dropped Fuji before I got there. Mm -hmm. But I had worked with performance since it started. I knew the founder and they were a disruptor from the very beginning. So they were a mail order company that started in Gary Snook's and Sharon's basement. And they were bringing cool bike products to people because bike shops weren't stocking it. Mm -hmm. So they filled a niche and Gary grew, you know, a great business and he sold you know, his interest in it or his majority interest in, in it over the years. But he was a, an innovative retailer. So Fuji was on a path to, you know, come back. In 2002, um, in the dealer market, you normally have territories. Like, you know, if you sell Keswick Cycle in Glenside, you can't sell anybody in yeah. Roslyn or, you know, the other nearby towns. Well, our first meeting with performance was like, we can sell you in all your, all your stores. And we made a decision that we would grow with performance wherever they opened, we would open. Um, we had an agreement, you know, we couldn't tell them how to run their business. They couldn't tell us we, we needed some time in some markets, but they were our, they were ASI's largest customer with Fuji they weren't really buying much of our other brands and we were selling our other brands to other retailers. Um, and, and we were selling um, brands like SE was sold to a lot of 
brand companies that were selling consumer direct. We weren't doing other sales, but we were. So we always wanted to be in all the markets wherever a consumer wanted to shop. Performance got in trouble. Um, they had a lot of debt and they weren't doing well. And we decided in 2016 that we would merge ASI, which was a strong financially you know, well-run company doing over $100 million worldwide um, to merge with performance. And performance was doing $260 million. Um, and we believed, and I believed, that we could turn it around. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a lot of models that we did. And I believe that, you know, if performance sold more of ASI's brands, we would generate more overall margin into the whole thing. And, you know, I could go into it for hours from a financial modeling standpoint, mm -hmm. it worked. But uh, in the end, I failed. I was unable to turn performance around and make it profitable. And, you know, timing being what it is, as my wife is getting ready to run for Congress, mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to file for bankruptcy in what would become a huge bankruptcy in the bicycle industry. Wow. Um, you know, that happened in 2018. Um, right, at, you know, at, at the time my wife was running, there were all sorts of rumors about my millions and millions of dollars and my factories in China and, and my offshore bank accounts. But as the bankruptcy probably proved everyone that money didn't exist, I was just <laughs> a guy trying to build a business yeah. um, and failed. Right. So, you know, bankruptcy, it's many, many things, but it's a failure. You know, I wasn't able to do what I thought I could do. And uh, you know, I, had developed a reputation in the bike industry. It's my life. I believe in it. Fuji and, and the company survives in, in a similar way to what it was before. One of the guys, actually almost everybody that works there worked for me when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, and performance was in essence liquidated. I you know, wanted something different. So I started um, consulting. And one of the companies that I consulted with, well, let me just pause there and let you ask a follow-up. So, you know, when you tie in like good things and bad things happening, my wife selected the Congress. I'm literally going through a chapter 11 process. Harry's doing well. My son, Pat, has finished six years working for Obama and has started a career in Hollywood, writing for the TV show Designated Survivor. Um, my younger son was working with me in, in North Carolina on Nash Bar, one of the brands that we owned in social media. So we're all, and Harry was still working for the company in sales. His um, soon-to-be wife, and Harry was also married in November, so I'm going through bankruptcy. Harry's getting married. My wife selected the Congress all at the same time. Um, and, and, and Harry, his soon to be wife, my son, Alex, all worked for me at, you know, advanced sports enterprises oh, in, in different positions. So, and they, they actually, they all outlasted me. I stayed and, and had a good transition, but Harry stayed for many months after I left. And, and so did his wife stayed until she went out on uh, maternity leave with their son Sawyer. So, you know, we had all this intermingled sure, stuff going sure. on. Um, so I don't know how you, uh, other than dumping it out on you, JT, that was <laughs> our 2018 November bankruptcy, marriage, elected to Congress. Um, yeah, it's like, you don't know whether to, to, jump for joy or cry or, or, I mean, there, there just had to be so many emotions going on, going around there. I mean, you personally, uh, I mean, from your own mouth says, look, I failed. So just professionally dealing with that, having your own family tied into the same company that you're, that you're saying you, you've failed for your wife, on the other hand is, is, is now a Congresswoman. Yeah. That had to, that had to be, uh, 
that had to be a really strange time in the house. It was. I'm sure. Um, I'm for sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, and sure. I was, and my house was a Hampton Inn in North Carolina because the bulk of the company performance was based in North Carolina and the bankruptcy occurred in North Carolina. So, you know, I was down there just living in literally, you know, Sunday night to, to Friday afternoon and then weekends, you know, in Congress camp, learning how to be a spouse. Right. Um, I, 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 Nothing uh, delays getting out of your own head than sitting in a Holiday Inn every single night after a bankruptcy court. That's like, <laughs> I, 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 well, I've probably spent four months out of the year living in a, in a hotel. So, um, my experience is it's it's probably better to be in a good mental space during those alone times, uh, away from family, sitting in a hotel room by yourself. So that well, I was to, I was sharing a room with my son Alex a lot of the time. Uh, so okay, we, well, we had we had that. Good. So. Well, at least at least you have that. So, um, so so you say you're doing some consulting, and is that what brings you to your your current position now? Yes. So I had met. Um, I'll just throw this out there. So. Sure. Along the way, Advanced Sports, ASI, internally, it became Authentic Stories Inspire was what was the behind the company. We had authentic brands. We focused on making sure those brands had authentic products associated with them. So Breezer, we had, you know, and I met Joe Breeze and, you know, he's a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like when he's having a bad day. <laughs> um, so Kestrel was the first carbon bike. So we, we were all into making these, these brands that we owned the best they could be based on good product. You know, my mantra was the product's not right. You can't sell it. You have to create good product um, and, and then build a plan around that. So um, that was it. So along the way, I got to be friendly with, the owner of Yuba, Ben Sarazen, who founded it, young guy, not from the bike business. Um, we were actually at a party one night. We're going around the table. Everybody was having a great time. And we said, well, ha you know, tell us your first job. So there was something that we wouldn't know about you. And he, he finally gets to him. He's like, I'm French. I did not have a job. So, you know, as a kid. Yeah. So he, he starts this company. And we, we developed a relationship just because I liked him. I thought he was authentic, you know, loved what he was doing, um, would have liked to have bought his company. But, but by the time I got to know him, we were in, in sort of that other place where we were trying to survive ourselves. We wouldn't have been a good fit. But so was, I, when I stopped at ASI, I started consulting for him and, and, and some other folks. And I just, love what he's doing and feel like it's an incredible platform based on authentic products. Right. He, he was like, I just think that, you know, it would be a better place that people could get rid of a car mm. and have a bike and a car or just a bike to carry their kids. And, you know, he developed these bikes that can carry three kids. They can carry 300 pounds. They can, you can use them for business. You can use them to surf. You can use them to paddleboard. You can use them for all sorts of stuff, but um, they're based on his passion for extending what someone can do with a bike. And one of his motivations was, I think he was in Costa Rica and he saw, you know, people, pushing a bike with lots of weight on it, right? Not it being able to ride it. He looked at that and his epiphany was, well, why don't we just make that, that a rideable product? Make yeah. that bike sure. be able to not just push it, be able to ride it and carry all that weight. Right. So I love that story because it's such a, you know, that, that to me is what, you know, a brand's foundation is when you have, a passionate person create a product around an idea. And so, you know, I just am all in buying in his vision in a different role. I'm, you know, president and chief operating officer. I'm, you know, behind trying to bring my experience and, and context in the industry to, to make um, Yuba 
become, you know, and fulfill, you know, th this other brilliant guy's vision. So yeah. I'm loving it. We do, you know, traditional bikes that you pedal and we do e-bikes. And as probably everybody listening knows, e-bikes are taking off in, in popularity. I'll throw this in there. E-bikes, the first e-bike was made in the 1800s, the late 1890s. Wow. I was involved in e-bikes in the 1990s. We were trying to do a $300 retail e-bike with a great big battery on the back. My son, Pat, broke his collarbone testing it when he was in <laughs> seventh grade. Um, and then, I, you know, we were in with e-bikes. So I'm a huge believer in how e-bikes allow people to use bikes for more mobility, mm -hmm. right? So they're just, they, they don't make sense for everybody. I don't think that you need a motor if you're a professional racer in the Tour de France. But, you know, for, for most people, having an assist, it, 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 it removes barriers to cycling, which is, you know, at the end of the day, what I hope I've done my entire career is get more people riding and enjoying bikes. And, you know, Yuba's a new avenue for that. Yeah. I, I encourage anyone, uh, I mean, full transparency. I didn't know really much about, well, I didn't know anything about Yuba. And then, you know, prior to this interview, I, I, I looked up, uh, I looked up the company, I looked at the products and, um, I told you before this started, it's like someone didn't have any cons, not concept. They had no uh, blueprint of how a bike should be used. And they just came up with their own way of looking at it. And, and that, that goes into, um, how you're, you're, you can have a child on the bike, how you can transport things, wheel sizes, and what's the best wheel size to have for, for transporting. Um, and I do, I like that story. It's almost like, you know, cause I've seen it over in the middle East. I've seen it in different places where people have just load, they'll just pack stuff on a bike and it's almost like a two wheel wheelbarrow. You know, if they they can drape stuff yeah. over it, and and uh, I do like the idea of of, of uh, you know that's innovation. You look at something, you see a problem, you go, "Hey, man, let's let's make a solution to it." You know, not everyone sees that, so it's it's cool. And you know, talking about the e bike, I think you know cyclists, I you know, especially the the road cyclists, they are. Uh, they're stuck in their ways. You know, you come from this old European, this is the way we're going to do things. Um, so, so when you, you, and it was such a counterculture for so long and they, they they got these purists and, and I like the idea that, Hey, uh, we want more people on bikes. This doesn't have to be your, your version of cycling. You know, the biking has been, it's so strange to me the way that it, it has really become so tribal, you know, you had your BMX people in the late seventies and eighties. Uh, then you had your, your roadies, you know, and Greg Lamont coming on in the scene really helped that, that, and obviously Lance Armstrong and then your mountain bike crew, they were completely different. You had such, you know, your Tomax or, 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 um, who's the guy, uh, Tinker Juarez, you know, these like yeah. crazy, there were, who was the woman racer you used to wear like a dead piranha around her neck. Um, it Jackie was, Fallon. yeah, it's right. And what a checkered past she's had, right. But, um, but they've had, uh, they everyone was so separated, but, it, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a bunch of people who like riding bikes. You know, it's like, that's what we, the, the thing that is in common. So, um, if your bike happens to have an electric mo you know, motor on it, who cares, man? I mean, I was, I'm fortunate that I, I've been able to travel a lot. And I was, I was hiking, uh, in Switzerland and I saw a guy coming up a mountain on a, on a really steep hill. And it was the first legit e-bike, like mountain bike. That was, I mean, full suspension. This thing was, this was, I mean, engineering wise was a very impressive machine. And it was the first time I looked at it and said, no, 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 that makes sense. I completely get what's going on. Th this isn't somebody that's just not in shape. They're just now able to ride a bike in a place or up a hill that they wouldn't traditionally be able to do. And I was like, yeah, I get it. This is, this is going to be something big. Yeah, it, it, it already is. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what's amazing. It's now, you know, it's 50% of the market in Germany. Mm. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Well, Pat, I, I, 
I really appreciate your time. You've been very gracious with your time. I mean, if you just look back in, in, you know, towards the end, we were talking about maybe it, it, something you thought you failed at, but you're literally talking about being 11 years old, working in a bike shop to working for a company that's making bikes for people racing the Tour de France. Uh, and that is, that is, if there's a spectrum, you, you have covered both ends of it. 100%. That is, uh, uh, a very impressive thing to me. Before we got on, I, I, I said, um, you know, we're both bike mechanics and I've known people that, that are in their, my age now that are still bike mechanics and not that there's anything against that, but, but it wouldn't even be in, in, in my mind that you can go from the mechanic all the way all to the management side of, of, uh, one of the biggest companies in, in the world of cycling. So, um, I appreciate you telling your story. I appreciate the personal stuff. Um, and uh, just just thanks for, for sitting down and, and taking the time to talk. Oh, thank you, JT. I really appreciate the opportunity and, and look forward to listening to more of these. I yeah. certainly enjoy listening to my son, Harry. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Maybe, uh, I mean, I, I feel bad at hitting up the entire family, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get your other son on it too or, 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 uh, or your wife. So uh, God knows you guys have a deep well of entertainment, entertaining stories or, or interesting stories. So well, we're, uh, we're Irish. So there's, you know, <laughs> we're day after St. Patrick's day. So that's right. That's right. We, we are stuck with that <laughs> yeah. as our mutual friend, Ian would, uh, that's right. Would acknowledge. That's right. Uh, all right, Pat, thank you so much. Thank um, you. And you enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thanks. All right. That's it for me. Thanks to Pat. Thanks for coming on, telling your story. Anyone else out there, if you are listening on Apple, I please, I implore you, I ask you to go ahead and leave a review. Good, bad, indifferent, some stars would be great. Uh, let me know how I'm doing. Most of all, I just want to say I appreciate you guys checking the podcast out. Again, log on to consequenceofhabit.com, subscribe to get more content, hear what's going on first. And that's it. I'll catch you guys next week. 